Okay. Hello, everyone. Yes, we'll make Bitcoin great. Yes. Um, okay. So yeah, I'm working on Lightning Network um, and some other. You know, Bitcoin's great. It's fun to work on. Uh, I'm gonna recap Lightning Network real quick. Um, the basic idea is you make channels between two nodes, and a channel, from the perspective of the rest of the world, is just a two of two multi-sig output. Um, and actually, you can't even tell it's two of two multi-sig. You just see an address with a three in front. Or in the case of SegWit, an address, well, we don't know what the addresses will look like yet, but a 32-byte long address. Um, so you make a channel. You keep updating the channel state with your counterparty. And you can close cooperatively by interactively signing. And you can close non-cooperatively by having these stored signatures. That's part wh where you update the channel state. Um, and then you sort of can have these multi-hop things going around with HTLCs, hash time lock contracts. And you can think of it as graph. And the channels are these edges. And the nodes are little vertexes. And so you have this nice connected graph. And you traverse the graph each via the HTLCs. Um, and so you can have these off-chain payments, which in non-adversarial conditions, when people get along and people are not jerks, uh, you have big speed and throughput increases. And in adversarial conditions, when people are being jerks, you fall back to somewhat similar security as the underlying network. As long as you're paying attention, you shouldn't lose any money. Um, they're, you know, you're not trusting them. Uh, so it's this nice trade. It's this, it sort of helps make the trade-off better in that, hey, if I'm getting along and this person's legit, we can go a lot faster, we can go a lot more scalable. And if this person is trying to kill me and take all my money, he still can't. So that's good. OK, so this is fairly well known, hopefully, by now. Um, but how do you build this network? You know, assuming all the software works great, uh, A and B want to make a channel. But wait, do they actually? Do A and B equally want to create a channel? And why? Do they know each other? You want this to work in an anonymous setting where people don't like each other, don't trust each other, and are you know, adversarial, trying to kill each other. Um, so dual funded channels are actually, they're very useful, but they're actually pretty tricky. Because you sort of need this confluence of wants where, OK, A is going to fund the channel, B is going to fund the channel, and they're going cre you know, to create a multi-sig address together. Um, there's sort of some trust involved. Because you're signing your UTXOs with this person who maybe you don't know. Um, are you sure you want to do that? Do they really want to make a channel with you? Maybe they just want to waste your time. Maybe they want to just waste your money's time and make this channel with you and then disappear. You don't lose much, but you do lose the opportunity that you could have made a different channel. Um, and so there's like timing issues, identity issues, lots of fun stuff. And this is one reason why you know, some people say hubs. Oh, Lightning Network is going to be all these hubs. Hubs are actually really tricky because if you say, I'm a node, I guess I assume the definition. So hub is not in the paper anywhere. We, I've, I've never said hub. Joseph's never said hub. But um, I assume when people say hub, they mean a node with a high degree. That's, I assume, what that means. Um, if you say, I'm going to run a node. I'm going to accept incoming channel creation. But I'm not going to really use money myself. I'm not going to be making payments. I'm just, I'm just going to be in the middle routing things. That's actually very tricky because if someone wants to make a channel with you, what do you do? Do you match their collateral? Or do you say, no, you have to fund the whole channel yourself? If you let them fund the whole channel yourself, you're actually never able to route because the leaves have all the value. So like, you know, you're the guy, Bob, in the middle. And there's Alice here and Carol here. They have all the money, so they can't actually route to each other. Um, whereas if you put up collateral, let's say you decide, I'll match anyone's collateral. If you want to make a channel and you put a Bitcoin in, I'll also put a Bitcoin in. Uh, you sort of open yourself up to denial of service attacks. If anyone with a lot of Bitcoin comes in and says, hey, I want to open a channel for a Bitcoin, opens a channel, and then does that a thousand times. Um, now they've tied up most of your capital, and they're never actually going to use your channels. So um, dual funded channels are very powerful and useful for many cases, but it's hard. So what about single funded channels? This is a lot simpler, right? A wants to make a channel with B. Maybe they want to pay B some money, or maybe they don't. But A is the one who's initiating this channel. A is saying, hey, B, give me a pub key. And B says, sure, here's a pub key. This, this costs me nothing, right? What do you, the worst you can do is disappear. I don't know, send money to my pub key? That sounds good. Um, so B is just like, yeah, I will generate a public key and give it to you. Um, and then A says, hey, B, here's this channel I want to open with you. Can you sign off on these refunds? You know, 
B says, yeah, sure, there's, there's no, no loss for B. So this is actually really easy to do. Um, and A gets to decide the initial state. So this can be you know, tied together with a payment. So A says, hey B, I'm gonna send you a Bitcoin. And the way I'm gonna do it is by making a channel with you and sending you a Bitcoin in that channel. And Bitcoin, B, B will say, okay, uh, I won't accept this as a payment until the channel has been established, but that doesn't take any longer than a normal payment to get confirmed. So yeah, here's a pub key, we'll make a channel. Um, there's one trick. Uh, one, one thing to be aware of is channel exhaustion. This is when a channel has all the money on one side. Um, and in general, you want to avoid this because it sets up, it's, it's really dangerous because of attacks, right? So let's say Alice and Bob have a channel. Alice has no money in the channel. Bob has all of it, right? Alice pushed it all over to one side. And now Alice says, okay, this is like state five of the channel. Back at state four, I used to have a Bitcoin. Now that it's state five, I have nothing. So broadcast state four, right? Alice no longer has anything to lose by broadcasting an invalid previous state. Um, so it's dangerous for the other guy. So basically, don't accept a state transition that will exhaust the other side. And don't try to exhaust from your side either because that's not very nice. Um, so basically, you always need this sort of buffer within the channel because if you completely push all the money to one side or the other, it becomes very cheap, you know, free for that person to try to attack and close the channel the wrong way. However, there's an exception to this where at the initial state of the channel, state zero, channel exhaustion is okay because there's no previous non-exhausted state to broadcast, so there's no real attack, right? So in the case where A is creating a, you know, channel with B, and let's say A is pushing all the money to B. So A says to B, hey, I want to make a payment to you of one coin, but let's do it in a channel. And the initial state, state zero of this channel, is you have a coin, I have nothing. B says, OK, because B knows that A, the worst A can do is broadcast, broadcast state zero to the blockchain, closing the channel as soon as it gets opened. Which, from B's perspective, the whole thing was kind of pointless. Why did you make a channel and then immediately close it with me? You could have just sent a payment. But that's OK. Uh, B doesn't lose any money. Um, so this helps the flexibility of single funded channels in that A can say make a full push channel to B where basically I'm opening a channel to you and pushing all the money in it to you as part of the channel creation process. Um, a can also open a zero push channel where they say hey B I'm opening a channel to you but I'm not actually sending you any money. I'm just opening a channel with one Bitcoin in it but I have the entire Bitcoin. And B says, okay, I lose nothing, and maybe it's, and now I'm a participant in a channel, so my, my node has a greater degree, which is kind of cool, and I can tell my friends I've got like five channels open. Um, so these are safe. However, after state zero, you do have to check to make sure that you don't exhaust the channel. Okay, so this allows a really simple, I don't want to say, well, okay, UI, but really, when I say UI, I mean like what keys do I type into the terminal at this point? Um, where you know, you're sort of saying pay, destination, amount. And no choices for the user. You just pay the full amount, but you open a channel to do so. Um, so the actual flow would be, okay, the user says pay this destination, this amount. First you look, do I have channels open? Do they have enough money to push out and can I route to this, this destination using the existing channels? If you can do that, great, use that, done. If you can't, open a channel for the full amount and push the entire amount to the, the new counterparty and then you're also done. And you know, this one takes 10 minutes or whatever. This one takes a few seconds. Um, but it's a no, it's, there's no extra cognitive load for the users. It, it can look a lot like existing Bitcoin uh, transactions. So this works, um, this is simple. It's also, it can scale in that um, you know, once channels start out exhausted, uh, they won't be for long because it starts out as this directed graph, but it can soon become like a bi-directional channel. Um, anyone trying to send you funds can then use these channels. And the arrows point the opposite direction you might think in that the, if you're doing this, this uh, simple UI and you say, okay, I want to pay, you know, here's Alice, here's Bob. Alice wants to pay Bob a coin. She opens the channel, sends the coin to Bob. There's now sort of this arrow from Bob to Alice in that future payments can be made from Bob to Alice using the network, but they cannot be made the other way. 
So if Alice gets, you know, receives money, then the channel becomes, you know, can be used for either direction. Um, you can also make cycles. So if you have, if someone opens a channel to you, and you open a channel to someone else, you you might be able to make a cycle somewhere else in the graph and equalize the channels that way. So it's so actually. So you can have it be bidirectional, but then it, it, the only thing it really adds is, is complexity for the user. In that I want to pay, you know, Alice wants to pay Bob one coin. How much should she put in the channel? Two coins? Three coins? You have to put at least one coin. But should you overfund the channel and only push one so that it starts out as sort of a, you know, balanced channel? And that's tricky because what if you only have five coins in your wallet, in your whole wallet? And should you lock up three? You know, should you put three coins in this channel with someone? Are you going to use it? You don't know their connectivity. You know, it, it adds a lot of complexity, whereas you can, at the cost of some you know, extra transaction, just say, look, the payment is a channel creation, and I'll use it from there. So, um, so it's, but yeah, it's, it's not as efficient, right? So overfunding channels can help. And that if you're you know, buying a coffee from Starbucks, and you just keep buying coffee every day and making an on-chain transaction every day, by establishing a channel every day, that's kind of annoying. So you may want to overfund the channel when you first create it, because you can say, hey, I'm buying a coffee, but I'm probably going to buy another tomorrow, so I'm going to fund enough for 10 coffees. Um, but right now, channels are really cheap to make. It's only about 12 bytes more in the transaction size. Um, and they're also pretty cheap to close cooperatively. It's two of two multi-sig, but since the whole SegWit thing has the inputs discounted, your like, V-size is like 25, 30 bytes more. It's pretty small. Um, so creating channels unnecessarily is not a huge cost. And it can be OK. Um, See, so yeah, And the thing is about the more complex Lightning Network transactions, which involve HTLCs and the pre-images and timeouts and all the fancy stuff, are probably not going to happen. Um, it's sort of like oxygen masks. In the, like, that's where most of the engineering is. And I'm sure in airplanes, they do a lot of work to make these oxygen masks. <laughs> But like I've never seen one happen. The plane just works fine. And uh, as long as things work fine, people use it. And somewhat like oxygen masks, people will probably use money using Lightning Network, but it won't be because of this. It'll be like I lost my phone, or someone hacked my server, and, and all of these fancy transactions will be sort of a separate thing. Um, so the real reason to open a channel without making a payment will be for new use cases, for things like, OK, streaming video, where I you know, open a channel and then pay micropayments, things like that. Um, but I think the straight, most straightforward way to sort of transition where people are like, what is this lightning thing? How does it work? What am I, you know, you don't want people to shoot themselves in the foot. So you can say, look, it works the same as Bitcoin, just under the hood it's opening channels. And if it can reuse those channels, it does. And if it can't, well, it doesn't. So this is sort of a nice transition. And then maybe years down the road when it gets more expensive to be making transactions, you'll already have this huge network of channels. OK, but now we have to talk about the real problem. And this is something that people have been ignoring scalability-wise. I mean, we've been talking about you know, capacity and latency and, and propagation and the you know, networks for miners and their SegWit and XT and Unlimited and salad forks and soft forks. And it's a mess, right? But nobody's really talking about the real problem here, uh, which is Bitcoin scalability. It's not up to snuff. Um, Bitcoin only has eight decimal places. Satoshis, right? And one US dollar is about 250,000 Satoshis. So a micropayment is, you know, micro, mu, a millionth, a millionth of US dollar, which is 0.25 Satoshi. So Bitcoin does not currently support micropayments. Uh, and it won't until the price of a Bitcoin falls below 100 US dollars. So this is a, you know, significant, it's been oversold. A lot of people are saying micropayments. As, <laughs> as soon as it went above 100 back in 2013 or so, like, doesn't support it anymore. Micropayments, uh, millipayments maybe, but not micro. Uh, so this is a huge problem. I mean, this is a little tongue in cheek, but you know, micropayments is something I'm interested in. Sort of, how can we push micropayments forward? Um, how can you do sub Satoshi payments? I guess right now, you know, it's only worth a couple hundred bucks. There's not a whole lot of reasons you want to do sub Satoshi, but this is this is a scalability problem. Maybe Bitcoin can't be worth. $10 million, because then that makes Satoshi's worth too much and you can't transact smoothly and stuff. Um, 
So you could trust your channel counterparty. In Lightning Networking, you can you know, say, hey, I'm sending you half a Satoshi, but it's trusted. And then the next time I send you half, we actually increment the state. But that's no fun, right? You're trusting your counterparty. Um, how can you subdivide this without trust? Well, the idea that I think is a good you know, way forward with this, which doesn't change Bitcoin in any way, is probabilistic payments, which I don't know if Rivest was like the first one to do this, but it was, you know, it's a fairly well-known uh, project of his called Peppercoin. Uh, he used like an inequality of the low, low significant bits of a RSA signature. He said, okay, if this low bit, low byte of the signature is above 200, then the payment happens. If it's below that, it doesn't kind of thing. Um, I don't, that was way before Bitcoin. That was using like existing uh, currencies and existing credit cards and stuff. Um, there's also people who have been written, writing about this in Bitcoin. Uh, my, old, my professor, Abhi Shalat, and uh, Rafael Pass wrote a paper about this last year of, you know, how can we make probabilistic payments? How can we say, like, look, I can't pay you half a Satoshi, but I can pay you one Satoshi with a probability of 0 0.5, and you will accept that proof of a probabilistic payment as the payment itself. And, in a, you know, in the long run, it ends up averaging out to be fine. Um, okay, so how can we make a probabilistic payment using Bitcoin today, or at least, you know, once you have channels, how can you pay someone with agreed upon probability? You don't want a trusted third party, that's cheating. Where do you get the randomness? Do you get it from like the block hash? Where do you, you know, where do you get randomness? And you've got a really limited set of opcodes. All the fun opcodes are in red here. You know, opcat. What, sir? Where do you get this one? Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes. <laughs> Yes, that's the only opcode that's left. Everything else here is gone. Opcat, if you had opcat, you can just make mask like tomorrow. Uh, op substring, op left, op right, all the fun stuff. But op size is still white. So you can use op size to check a pre-image length. So the basic idea is, you know, a fancy way to say it is two-party NB3 cake cutting, which there is a Wikipedia page. If you search that, there's math, there's like symbols. Um, but it's divide and choose. This is something little kids know. It's like, okay, if you have two people and they want to split something evenly, okay, one person cuts it in half and the other person picks which half. Uh, so that you sort of have this interactive process where no one can, you know, you've, you're sharing the computation. Um, okay, so the basic, the super high level view is the divider picks a pre-image length, either 20 bytes or 21 bytes. The divider hashes it, sends the hash to the other guy or girl, I think Carol. Um, the chooser then picks a pre-image length based on the hash, and if they choose the wrong length, they win. If they choose the right length, they lose. That way, uh, well, you'll see it, it, it works that way. Because um, otherwise, you know, if, if they could just give the two wrong lengths and stuff. Okay, um, so you make this iterative, you need a couple more steps. You have to sort of put your channel in limbo first so that you can't back out of it. Um, so you sort of tear up the previous state you make, you make a state that's not valid for another couple hours. So like you use op CSV or something. And then um, you tear up the previous state. So now your, your channel's in limbo and you cannot immediately close uncooperatively. Because otherwise the person who sort of made the payment could take it back. Um, so in this case, Dave is the decider. Carol is the chooser. And Dave is paying Carol half a Satoshi or five nano bitcoins. Okay. So... Carol makes two random pre-images of length 20. Uh, hashes them both, sends both hashes to Dave. Says, okay, Dave, here's hash Y1 and hash of Y2. Dave makes a single pre-image, which is L bytes long. Dave has to choose 20 or 21. And now hashes that and makes two output scripts and makes two transactions spending, you know, with these output scripts signs them, hands the partially signed transactions over to Carol. And I'll go through the script. So basically there's three paths. I mean, this is not the actual opcodes. The opcodes op are kind of ugly looking, but I'm sort of making it like C-like looking in that the way you can spend this money is either sign from Carol and wait 10 blocks. So Carol can get the money, but she has to wait. Dave can get the money if he knows why one, which is Carol's secret pre-image. Or Dave can get the money. Why is this thing here? Eh. Or Dave can get the money if he knows the pre-image X and the length of X is 20. Alternatively, same thing up here. Kale gets the money after 10 blocks. 
or Dave gets the money if he knows why too. These are sort of the revocations. So Carol can rely, you know, can reliably revoke a claim on one of these transactions. Or Dave knows X and pre-image X is of length 21. So the way it works is Carol gets the money no matter what after a while. And so the real question is, can Dave, can Dave get the money immediately or not? The way Dave can get the money is either he knows Y1 and Y2, and since Carol hasn't said that to Dave yet, he can't. So the only thing that matters initially is this length part. So Dave signs both, sends both to Carol. Carol now can choose, OK, which, which transaction do I want to pick and sign myself? OK, so Carol now has two half-signed transactions, these two. She can do a couple things. She can do nothing. She can sign and broadcast both. She can sign and broadcast one of them. Or she can choose one of them, sign and send the signature, as well as the opposite transactions pre-image that she made to Dave. This is sort of the five and six are the cooperative ones. Three and four are the non-cooperative. One and two are just dumb. Um, so we will start with the first one. She can do nothing. The channel is in limbo for the next 20 blocks or so. And Dave is like, what the heck, Carol? and then closes the channel after the limbo ex expires. So the payment did not happen. But it was a payment to Carol, and I don't know. So it's not dangerous for Dave. At worst, you, you know, the, the whole thing times out. Uh, Carol can sign and broadcast both of these transactions. This closes the channel. Um, it's really the same as signing and broadcasting only one. It's just now you're letting the miners decide which, which signature to accept instead of choosing one yourself. So if you really want to like, oh, I don't even want to pick. I'll just sign both and see what happens. OK, but now if Dave is in friends with one of the miners, that's very dangerous because Dave knows which one he profits from. Um, but assuming that you're just doing this normally, Dave waits for one of the transactions that gets in the block and then proceeds as if that one were broadcast. OK, so two ends up being a lot like three, four. OK, so she can sign and broadcast the chosen transaction. If she chose the wrong length, she wins after 10 blocks. If she chose the right length, Dave sweeps immediately, right? So let's say x is actually uh, 21 bytes long. And Carol chooses 20. So she signs transaction 1, broadcasts it to the blockchain, gets in a block. She can't spend this for another 10 blocks, but Dave can never spend it, right? Dave doesn't know y1. Dave does know x, but x is 21 bytes long. So he's stuck. The script won't execute on any of Dave's keys. Uh, so Carol just has to wait 10 blocks. Carol signs, and then 10 blocks later gets the money. Um, let's say Carol chooses the right length, which is the wrong thing for Carol to choose. Um, it's a little confusing. Carol signs this, broadcasts this. Dave should actually wait until it's confirmed, right? Because there's sort of like, he doesn't, you know, he, sh he should wait until it gets confirmed. And then as soon as it's in a block or two, it's like, OK, I'm, not, I'm pretty sure it's not going to get double, because Carol might try to double spend and stuff. So once it's in a block or two, Dave's like, great. I know x. x is of length 21. I will sign, and I will use this part of the script and take the money. Um, this, this, these three and four, sign and broadcast, means you're closing the channel. And right now, that's much more expensive than one Satoshi, so you shouldn't do that. But you can, and you need to be able to. Um, OK, so 5, 6 is Carol chooses, cooperates, and indicates to Dave which side she's choosing, right? So let's say Carol chooses 20. She signs transaction 1. She also sends Y2 to Dave. This means that if Carol later tries to sign and broadcast transaction 2, Dave gets it immediately. Whether he, whether it, no, regardless of the length of x, Carol is saying, look, I revoke my claim on transaction 2. I'm signing transaction one and giving the signature of transaction one. This is the one I choose, and I revoke my claim on the other one. So now Dave can broadcast transaction one, um, and they sort of know who won, right? And so they can say, OK, GG. Oh, sorry, wait, this is Sig Dave. Uh, there might be, I have the actual opcode somewhere else. There might be a mistake. Yeah, no, this works because um, Dave can't broadcast this because he does not have Carol's signature yet. Yeah, so Carol s sends the signature for this. Dave can broadcast this whenever he wants. Carol does not sign this but gives the revocation. So if she ever does sign it, it becomes very dangerous for her to broadcast. Okay, so then they sort of 
can GG. And basically, Dave needs to then reveal X and say, hey, guess what? It was 21 bytes. And then Carol says, ah, oh, shoot. Well, you won. I didn't get this payment. Or Dave says, hey, you won. Look, X is 20. And then they update the state to reflect um, that the payment went through. But this is a, you know, so that part's cooperative, but they could have broadcast at any time up to the sort of GG part. Um, so you can iterate it, right? And you, after Carol sends the pre-image and the signature, Dave needs to reveal. They both know who won. They cooperate, update the channel state. They don't have to cooperate and update the channel state. Either party can close at that point with the winning or losing transaction. Um, but it's a lot, you know, the incentive, so it's not really trust because you, you can close given the single Satoshi difference, but it's a lot cheaper to keep going and iterate on that. Um, so for sub Satoshi, I sort of made this fairly simplified because you actually make the transactions with two outputs and you sort of flip the scripts because otherwise you're closing the entire channel to one place. So you really make two output scripts, one which one gets one of the other and you just change by one Satoshi. But anyway, it, it works like that. You could, in theory, also make more than one Satoshi for these output sizes difference. Um, so the timing for this is when Carol gets those two transactions from Dave, she considers that payment and then provides the service she's pay, you know, providing or something like that. She, Carol does not have to wait for the rest of the sequence to happen. Um, and she can always close with the probability of an increment of Satoshi after this point. And so you don't have to wait for the entire process to clear. You say, OK, Dave has given me the signature and these, you know, the two signatures, two transactions. I know as long as this hash function is working and everything's working normally, I've gotten half a Satoshi. Um, so yeah, you can do half a Satoshi. If you want 0.333 repeating, OK, you have three scripts and three different lengths. And that pre-image can only be one length. Uh, you can have 0.25, you can have 1.1. You can't really do like one in a thousand because that would mean your pre-image lengths have to go up to like a thousand bytes and that's really, I don't, that won't even fit. I think like 500 or something. Yeah, uh, the thing is you can't, so like you only have like two hash functions, right? You have SHA-256 and RIPE-MD-160 because the others are chained and so if you know the pre-image of a double chain, you know the, pre the intermediate one. So like you can, you can double it that way. You can, you, can, you can get twice as much that way, but you can't like, anyway, there are ways to, to scale it out more. But so anyway, so you don't get like a bazillion different probabilities, but you do get like at least an order of magnitude scalability in the down direction, right? You can definitely have 10, you know, a 10th of a Satoshi and you can actually do better. Um, but, a ten, but just this simple version gets you at least like 10X. Um, so yeah, the kind of fun part about it is it relies on the collision resistance, right? So if you can, if Dave can collide, uh, you do two to the 80 work and you find two different length pre-images that collide to the same hash and he can cheat. But right, you know, so if, if that's the problem, okay, use hash 256 instead of hash 160. And honestly, like two to the 80 work is worth more than the Satoshi. Um, and probably for now, right. And so I was actually trying to think like what scenario would be two to the 80 work is worth less than Satoshi. It is possible using Bitcoin as it's designed today, but it's like a very different planet than what we live on today. Uh, <laughs> but it's possible. Um, and you can actually do really short pre-images, right? So you can say like, I'm gonna say, okay, it's 12 or 13. And it seems really dangerous, right? Because, well, it's two to the 96 work for Carol to make a pre-image attack. Right, to actually brute force and find one of the pre-images. And you think, oh, well, it's only two to the 48 work for Dave to collide. But there should be no colliding pre-images with that short of a length for hash 160. So you can, you can actually, I mean, it's totally academic because like, why not just use 20 and 21? But you can actually go down uh, as well to shorter pre-images. And, and there's also sort of this trade-off where like, even if you could do two to the 50 or 60 work, it's for a Satoshi and right now, the Satoshi is worth much less. And it's the same, hashing function is mining, so if you have lots of ASICs to try to cheat at this, why not just mine? Um, so it's, it's a kind of fun math stuff. Anyway, okay, so summary of all this fun stuff. So single funded channels are easier. They're easier for me to program, they're easier UI-wise, they're easier to think about. 
I like it. I want to put that in my software. Um, exhausted channels are bad, but exhausted on open is OK. So you can make these channels one-sided at their first state, and then they eventually become nicely balanced. Uh, and the network can grow with single-funded transactions, uh, single-funded channels. And transactions are pretty cheap right now. So yeah, long term, you want it to be like really efficient, and single-funded transactions uh, channels are not as efficient. You may end up making more channels. And it's kind of ugly that you have like five channels open with the same person. Like the, these two nodes have five channels, and like why not just have one? But right now it's OK. Um, is there more text at the bottom here? Oh. Huh, weird. That's weird. Um, OK. Uh, so yeah, these, uh, the real scalability problem has been ignored until now. Uh, Pre-image length probabilistic payments. PILP, I don't know. Uh, can scale Bitcoin in the true micropayment range. And trustless nano payments, and maybe Femto and Addo, you could maybe make chains of these things. So like one's conditional. Yeah, I, we don't need that yet, but someday. Um, so you can avoid the divisibility forks, which, you know, five years from now, everyone's going to be arguing about extending to 10 decimal places. And we want, you know, int 128. So no, we need int 256. And there's going to be all sorts of clients fighting each other. Uh, we're going to try to prevent that from happening way before it happens. And um, while these transaction types and all this the whole idea may have a low demand, given the current price of Bitcoin, we do need to plan for the future. Also, it's kind of fun to think about these things. Um, right. OK, so wait, eh, oh, do I have to go back to? Eh? Yeah, I have a, wait. Eh? Questions? OK, there probably are some, but yeah, causality. Uh, and also, thanks to DG717. <laughs> And Denise and Michael for setting things up, and Co Chain Code Labs and Blockstream for the pizza. And thanks for everyone for coming. So, <laughs> questions? <All right. laughs> uh, no, no, no. no, just yell. That's yeah. okay, I can show. Hey, can you repeat the questions? I will, oh, because this is where they like record it? Okay, I will repeat into this. So, yeah. without uh, some kind of salary point, yes. uh, you can't really do probabilistic payments. Uh, so the question is about like forking to have s sort of y your yeah I okay the the actual broadcast on channel part is crazy you shouldn't do that it doesn't make any sense but you can <laughs> um, so the real thing to do is do it cooperatively and interactively, right? Where you're sending the pre-images. So this all, all happens in a chain. And it all happens offline. You can, at any time, broadcast. So there is this sort of weird threat of taking the Satoshi. But yeah, currently trans... Yeah, you'd have to spend way more, right? Right, but yeah, that's a sunk... It is, yeah, the, you're going to close the channel anyway. It's a sunk cost. So whether I... You know, I've already allocated the, the fee for closing the channel. So it is sort of like there is a difference of one Satoshi between whether you close the channel now or later with this payment, with this probabilistic payment. Okay. So. Two questions. Yeah. Can you imagine a scenario where opening a channel that is exhausted that is a bad idea? I understand it's okay under other conditions where there aren't any incentives to play, but are there conditions where it's bad? Idea? Okay, so the question is opening a channel that's exhausted. What are possible problems with it? Um, it depends which direction it's exhausted in. So if I'm opening a channel and pushing all the money to one side, it's really similar to just a payment. Um, and so it's got the same risk, you know, risk. If I'm opening a channel and so the one, the one sort of risk would be someone saying, hey, open a channel with me. I've got so many channels already. If you open a channel with me, you will definitely be able to pay like anyone really quickly. Um, they might go offline. So you, you can pe get people to sort of say like, hey, come on, open a channel with me and keep all the money on your side. You're not actually paying me because I don't sell anything. Um, that, is, that requires a little bit of trust in that you might open a channel with them and they might just ignore you so and they have to close it. Since it requires a little bit of trust, do you see it being useful for credit relationships? Uh, I mean, credit and identity. and Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a pretty, it's the transaction fee worth of trust. So... It's pretty cheap, but yeah, you might want to know, okay, who's, who is this? And do they actually, you know, they can maybe prove they have a lot of channels, things like that. It's pretty cheap now. Wait until 
Right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, in a world where Bitcoin's $100 and you want to open a channel without pushing a payment through, you probably you might want the identity of the, pers of the node you're opening a channel with. Can you get credit for identity? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, ideally, you don't have identity in any of this, so it all is anonymous and everything like that. But yeah, once, if you want the efficiency and you want to not open a channel that ends up doing nothing, uh, and it's purely single funded, and it's exhausted, it can be tricky. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, one way to limit the amount of process is starting opening a channel is to make it so that folks who sign up for the channel are not going to be able to sign up for the channel. Right. Uh, but one sign up will start with the pledge. So you kind of make it so each one takes the same amount of everyone who's pledged and multiplies by like one point one and goes back and forth until they're kind of their priority. Yeah, yeah. So Uh, yeah, so the question is about like if you know, le there's less trust involved when it's a dual funded channel. And in some ways, there's less trust in that they're both sharing the transaction fee. Um, there's still sort of identity maybe going to be involved in that like you can tie up. It's pretty minimal in that like the worst case scenario is someone, let's say the transaction fee is somehow $100, and someone pays $50 to open a channel with you, and you also pay $50, and then they just disappear and they paid $50 to cause you to make $50 and it's kind of annoying. Uh, so there's still like going to be this identity, you know, and that you want to know. So really the ideal way to do it is you're paying someone and like, okay, I'm buying a computer from Newegg and I will open a channel with Newegg and I will pay the transaction fee. Hopefully it's not a hundred dollars and you know I'll pay the one dollar transaction fee or whatever send Newegg the payment and I'll also put more in because I know who Newegg is and the thing is with commerce there's always going to be trust right if you're sending someone money you probably trust them to some extent in that like they're giving you something in return there's always going to be that sort of issue um so um so I, I think the best way to do to scale this out if transaction fees become higher is couple payments and channel creation um, that seems the most straightforward way to do it. Okay. Any other? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks for the presentation. Sure, sure. You mentioned that you didn't say payment cards like the white paper. So in the white paper, you do talk about how the future knowledge of the network will look pretty much on the internet with zero one ISPs. Probably. So which that kind of looks like payment cards will look like. So it's sort of like. Okay, so the question is you know, in the paper, we don't talk about hubs. But we do talk about this topology looking something like the internet and in that it's going to have some hierarchy. It's not going to be flat, right? There's going to be a Pareto distribution of nodes, degrees, and stuff like that. And that's just sort of like the way the universe works. Like you can't stop. You can, a lot of people try to like make everything like a flat distribution. It just never works. Uh, <laughs> because <laughs> you're like, oh, let's have everyone have the same amount of this and that. And, and it just the universe is not flat. It's everything's power law. Um, so you're going to have people, you're going to have merchants that have thousands and thousands of channels with thousands of different customers. And then you're going to have someone who has got like one channel and they don't, don't really use Bitcoin. They just used it for this one thing once and they have this channel open and they just leave it. Um, so, so I think that the natural state of like any large network is going to be like a scale free graph. So you're going to have, you're going to have a, some nodes with a ton of channels and everyone's going to route through them. And that might not be because they're running the node only to be a node and route. It might be that they're amazon.com. And so they have just tons of channels with everyone. And so they end up routing payments, something like that probably. Yeah. Yeah, that could that that can The internet's been hanging on so sort of. <laughs> I mean, so the so the question is sort of like, okay, if there are these large nodes and they don't want to run the actual nodes themselves and they sort of outsource this to other companies and then it starts looking like payment processors as they traditionally are, um, 
there's definitely room for that, but you don't have to do that. You know, so there will be probably companies that can handle that kind of stuff for you. It's sort of like Bitcoin, where ideal, like, I don't know, ideally, but the initial vision is like, okay, every, it's peer-to-peer. -peer. Everyone's running full node. Everyone's doing this. And like most people seem not to. And a lot of people are like, I'll use blockchain.info, even though they keep scooping, you know, it's like there's all these problems with blockchain.info. Um, people keep using it and there's, and they don't want to, you know, it's a lot cheaper when you trust people. Um, and so there are issues with that in Lightning and everything else. Um, but if you want to have your own private keys, you're going to have to be running your own, your own node and routing. And if you say, hey, I'm going to have a thousand channels, I'm this big merchant, and I'm just not going to route. You can do that. You can s turn off routing in your software. But there's fees you're missing out on. And then also people are like, well, I like Amazon. But actually, when I open a channel with Amazon, the only thing I can do is buy stuff from Amazon. It's kind of a dead channel. I can't route any, like, for whatever reason, they just don't let anything route through it. So I'd, rath I'd rather open a channel with Newegg because Newegg has routing enabled. Um, so those are sort of the trade-offs. Um, and I don't, you know, there will be people with way more money and way more channels and way fast, faster computers than I'll ever have. And that's just life. So, <laughs> so um, as long as it's not like, inherent in the system itself that it sort of like converges to one singleton that owns everything and like and then and as all as long as you can route around it and say like hey we're gonna make our own network that we don't even connect to everyone else we just have a couple channels with friends and we're gonna run it like that then that to me is like probably good enough to keep it if not decentralized then you know decentralizable or something <laughs> so <laughs> yeah ah yes sorry Uh, right now, it's, oh, so he's asking, you know, what are the current business cases for probabilistic payments? Um, well, no, I, no, don't do, if you're doing gambling, you just do it some other way, like Satoshi dice. Um, right now, it's more like if you want to do it, you know, sub Satoshi. But there, the thing is, if you have the technology to do sub Satoshi, there might be kind of cool use cases. Um, for larger payments, you can just do them within the channels themselves, so they're not as useful. So I don't, like, I'm not writing the software for this now. It's sort of a scalability thing for later, but people will think of interesting things to do with it. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm not touching this stuff. <laughs> uh, but yes, very good, good question. <laughs> Other questions? Are we good? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, like, assuming that just I don't know, have, have you worked out sort of the the math of how much uh, Bitcoin you would expect people to have frozen in like realistic scenarios where maybe like I know I expect to spend one unit per day and I want a channel to maybe you know for thirty days. And all that. Yeah. Um, Okay, so one, so the question is like, you know, realistic scenarios of how channels work and how much you allocate. One, I, would, I wouldn't use the word frozen because if this thing works, which I'm, that's my job to make it work and I hope it does and I think it will, um, you may think of Bitcoins not in a channel as frozen rather than the Bitcoins in the channel as frozen. And that the Bitcoins that are just on your regular UTXO in your wallet, they take 10 minutes to send anywhere. Whereas the ones that are in channels that are in well-connected a well-connected graph can be sent like in a few seconds. So it's sort of like you might say to your friend like, hey, you have all these channels open. You have really good connectivity. Can I just open a channel with you? And I'm not going to put any money through it, but I know you. And so they're like, yeah, sure. And then any, and I leave my computer on at home running or, you know, I have like a Raspberry Pi, which runs my lightning node or something. Um, and then you're like, okay, I'll put half of my coin, you know, I'll put a decent amount of coin, whatever I think I'm going to spend in that with my friend or wherever. Um, and there are probably going to be all sorts of services like that. Um, because once it's really fast, it's kind of like, oh, it's not frozen. This is really fast. So, so the other thing is, it's sort of the, the line, line between like hot wallet and cold wallet. So like I have, I have a laptop which only has like Linux and Bitcoin D on it. And that's where I have a couple of Bitcoins. And then I have a cell phone which has like 
a partial, you know, half a, you know, half a Bitcoin or something on it. And so it's like, well, this is my hot wallet. And then this other thing I have like as a cold wallet. So one thing about lightning channels is they are kind of hot, right? In order for them to be routable, in order for them to work, you need this computer to be online and it has the private key. So it's a little scary. Um, so it's sort of your spending money to some extent in that like, I don't anticipate, you know, if you have a ton of savings, you don't put that in a channel necessarily. But if you have something like a couple hundred bucks that you're going to be spending around town, you put that in various channels. Uh, so I think that's sort of the ideal use case. Um, but yeah, but the other thing is like, I'm not going to build the network. Like people are going to do weird stuff that I had no idea they would do. And so we'll see what they do with it. Um, hopefully, but you know, so from the designing designer point of view, it's like try to make it really hard for people to shoot themselves in the foot. Try to you know make the defaults sensible, all the stuff like that. Um, but then people are going to start changing the code and doing crazy stuff. So, um, who knows? <laughs> yes. Oh, so the question is, can independent Lightning networks swap liquidity? Uh, do you mean like on different blockchains themselves, or? Yeah, so, so one thing that, um, since this is Bitcoin devs, we didn't usually talk about altcoins, but you could open an altcoin channel to a node, and then that same node has a Bitcoin channel, and you can sort of route via altcoins, or sidechains, or permissioned ledgers, or whatever you want to call altcoins today. Um, so like you could have you know, Dogecoin in the middle, like Alice has a Bitcoin channel to Bob, Bob has a Dogecoin channel to Carol, Carol has a Bitcoin channel to Dave. Um, the endpoints are all moving Bitcoin, but somewhere in the middle, there's this Dogecoin transaction that happens. And I, I think Dogecoin has hash 160 and all the same you know, opcodes and stuff. So the people on the ends don't really care how the payment gets there. So yeah, you can definitely have inter-chain liquidity provision. So you could run a node and you could say like, look, I'm going to trade Bitcoins for Dogecoins because I want more of one or the other. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's not going to be like the lightning network and that like people can make separate graphs easily. It's really software. Uh, I, we sort of thought of it as like the Bitcoin lightning network as in there will be a pretty big graph of well, you know, connect of where there's paths between everyone so that Bitcoin payments can happen. There's also going to be all sorts of weird subgraphs for like altcoins and altcoins to this thing and stuff like that. And people will call those other things, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. It's all going to be running on, but send me money. yeah, send me money. And, and Bitcoin's going to be the sort of core settlement, it seems like. Money. Yeah, it's going to be the core money that everything happens with. So, Cool. Other, oh, yes. Um, thanks for the great presentation. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so, so the question is sort of interoperability of various Lightning software, be it on the same blockchain or different blockchains. Um, the thing is, so, okay, the first is if you're on different blockchains, make sure you have the same hash functions and make sure you have similar enough opcodes. So maybe we should make like a spec of like your blockchain needs to support this in order to support Lightning. <laughs> um, uh, but generally most of the blockchains are derived from the Bitcoin source code, and so they do. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. Like, does the Hyperledger project or like IBM's thing or, you know, what all these other companies are making, will it support it? And, and in general, yes, as long as they have, it's mostly based on like hash functions and some other like opcodes. Um, mostly they're compatible, but they might design it in a way that's really annoying to program and stuff like that. So if it's, you know, like you could probably do it on Ethereum, but I haven't really looked at the Ethereum scripting language, so it might be actually kind of tricky. Um, so whereas if it's like Dogecoin, it's probably really easy because it's the same as Bitcoin. Um, and then in terms of the different clients, like we're not really at a point where we have fully functional clients. Um, so getting it all sort of standardized, I think it's going to happen after we've got stuff working. And 
I think, you know, we're, we're sort of, like, the different people are sort of working on their own different topologies and stuff, and we'll all get it interoperable in, eventually. The nice thing is that you can have, it's not like Bitcoin where everyone's code has to agree on stuff. With Lightning Network, you can have, like, oh, I'm running Lightning X, and you're running Lightning Y, and there's a subset of features that they can agree on and use, and mine does this other cool thing, and yours doesn't, so I just don't use that. Um, and you can actually even upgrade your software while keeping the same channels. Right, you open a channel with version one, you upgrade your software to version two, the channel itself on the blockchain remains the same, but you can now have new state uh, transactions that you exchange with the parties. So it's, it's gonna be a little bit of a mess, but it's a lot easier than dealing with like Bitcoin where you have to like get everyone to upgrade at the same time and stuff like that. So cool question. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Offshore. Okay, so the question is sort of, with Bitcoin, you see all the UTXO set, you see all the blocks, you see all the transactions. With Lightning, you don't see what happens within the channel over weeks or even months or years. Um, and some people like seeing it. So it's, to some extent, it's a feature in that you don't know how much money I have. And it's, you can always prove your channel state. Um, you can prove, you can say, okay, at state 75, which is the current state, I have this allocation within the channel, and you can prove that to any party pretty, pretty easily. You basically have that on your hard drive. Uh, in order to prove that the allocation at a state, and in order to prove that this is the most recent state, you have to have both parties agree to prove and sign. Because otherwise you could say, hey, I'm at state 75 and I have five Bitcoins, and actually you're at state 80 and you have one. Um, so you can always, you can always like draw, you know, you can always tell someone an old state. Um, if you get both parties to cooperate and they say, nope, we're at state 75, this is the current most recent state, and you can prove to someone else. Um, Yeah, I guess, okay, so if you want total finality where even if the two parties are colluding, you need to know. The thing is, if the two parties are colluding, they just sort of like, they're really good friends and they share private keys and then you really can't know even on the chain, right? Because they sort of, they've shared their private keys. But yeah, you could, I don't know, if you wanted to be crazy, say like, no, you must close this channel to prove at this point you've got this allocation. So you could. Um, but colluding parties seems like such a big problem that nothing, you know, even, the, even Bitcoin itself doesn't really help in that if Alice says, I've got five coins, and Bob says, no, I, I've got 10, and really they swapped private keys beforehand or something. That's the level of collusion you'd need. So. Well, it's a useless thing to sign anyway. You know, you say 80 is, I, I, I assign the fact that it says, yes, 80 is, is the current state, but then by the time you send it down, now 83 is the current state. Yeah, I mean, it can change. Yeah, well, it's a snapshot. You just look, look at you know, April 11th, I had this much in this channel. Maybe the auditor wants to know that. And you can show that that was, the, you, you can show at least that your counterparty said this and you said this. And there is a, you know, you, you have a path back to a transaction on the blockchain. And you're like, here's, here's the two of two multisig, here's coming out of it, the state, and you can show. But it's kind of, it's not Your counterparty would have to lie. Either, either, you're, brought, either you're proving a previous state, Oh yeah, if the other guy lies, sure. It's no big deal. <laughs> as long as you lie about an old state. Yeah, I mean so but yeah, that's the party that's the problem in like all of accounting and all of these things is if there's a lot of people colluding to do the wrong thing. Doing the wrong thing gets really easy to do because <laughs> everyone's doing it. So yeah. So it's it I don't think it's any worse than the existing blockchain for that kind of thing.
Okay, other questions or we're good and we can, huh, huh? Okay, cool, so, huh, huh? That's it, sounds good? All right, thank you everyone.